Why are so many feminist philosophers concerned with the discourse of consent? Consent has really come to the fore in recent decades as the guiding norm for sexual ethics. You see all kinds of college campuses have uh, consent policies that have shifted a bit over the years um, from a sort of negative view of consent as uh, the absence of a no to affirmative consent, the presence of a yes to enthusiastic consent. And even as this model of consent comes to the fore in university policies and public discourse, a lot of feminist scholars have been critical of the concept of consent, concerned that it can't really achieve the aims that a lot of public discourse thinks it can. I'm philosophy professor and Overthink podcast co-host Ellie Anderson, and I'm here today to talk about my view of the matter, which you can find in a printed version in the peer-reviewed academic journal Feminist Philosophy Quarterly. The article is titled A Phenomenological Approach to Sexual Consent, and it was published in 2022. For one, there's a concern that consent seems to be this neutral norm to which everybody has equal access, but in fact, it's often subtly coerced due to patriarchal social scripts. From a young age, those socialized as girls are taught to say yes to other people and to put others' feelings before their own. And so when it comes to sexual settings, there may be a sort of default uh, tendency for those socialized as girls to say yes when um, they're not even sure if they really want something or not. And so this idea that consent happens in a vacuum outside of early childhood socialization uh, is really a sort of idealized fiction. Plus, when you think about the standard scene of consent, it's often implied that it's something that women give and men receive or demand, which is sort of a weird way of thinking about sexual encounters, which presumably involve uh, sort of mutual giving and receiving of both parties. What's more, consent is overly legalistic. So consent is a really useful and necessary tool for the law. But what happens when we model our ethics on the legal sphere, rather than recognizing that the ethical sphere is actually a lot more messy than the law, and even with law, if things are messier than they might first appear. Sexual experiences are often very complex. They involve bodies, they involve desires, we're not always aware of our own desires. And so there's a failure to accommodate the complexity, the intercorporeality, we might say this, this mutual embodiment, um, as well as ethical negotiation and the nature of the self. Some have also suggested that consent serves to protect perpetrators more than it does victims of sexual violence because the claim can be, well, she consented and so I didn't do anything wrong. And this black and white picture of consent that we've been drawing really papers over the ambiguity and gray areas of many sexual encounters, as a lot of scholars have recently drawn attention to. So I'm canvassing and summarizing a lot of views here, but you can find tons of footnotes in the paper version of this. A couple people that come to mind for recent work on this notion of the ambiguity of sexual encounters are Joseph Fischel, uh, Catherine Angel, Linda Martine Alcoff, and a little bit further back, Anne Cahill. One thing that I also find bothersome about a lot of discourses on sexual consent is that they assume we know nothing about a partner's intentions aside from a clear verbally expressed yes or no. And this just isn't the way that humans interact. It's definitely not the way that humans interact who know each other. And it's also not even the way that humans interact when they don't know each other. Even strangers uh, having a sexual encounter for the first and perhaps only time are picking up on all sorts of bodily cues that uh, exceed the realm of explicitly expressed language. At its root, the problem with consent as the guiding norm of sexual ethics, according to these critiques that I've just been summarizing, is that it views consent as a form of giving permission, and specifically of giving permission to somebody else to use your body. This is what philosopher Heidi Hurd calls the moral magic of consent, which is this idea that consent turns what would otherwise be sexual violation or rape into permissible sex. And I and many others find this view of sexual ethics to be very strange, <laughs> because the idea that we would be conceiving of permissible sex as the sort of transformed, morally transformed version of sexual violation seems to get things profoundly backward. And even the notion of giving permission as the key to sexual ethics seems weirdly modeled on property rights and not actually on 
messy interchanges between humans. And so for all these reasons, the bottom line of which is that consent is viewed as giving permission, and giving permission is sort of a weird way to think about having sex, scholars have responded by saying that we need a new way to think about sexual ethics, and consent specifically. And there really, to my mind, have been three forms of response here. One is to reject consent altogether and to say that we should be moving away from the language of consent when we're talking about permissible sex because consent is so deeply tied up with the notion of giving permission. This is something that Jonathan Jenkins Ichikawa has recently argued, uh, also a philosopher working in this space. The second view is that we should sort of dethrone consent, such that it can still be a guiding norm for sexual ethics, but it shouldn't be the primary or even the only norm. This is something that Linda Martine Alcoff has argued in her 2017 book, Rape and Resistance, saying that consent should be one of four or even more norms that we should use to guide our sexual ethics. Now, the third option is to redefine consent and to say that actually the connotation of giving permission isn't essential to consent itself, but rather we can redefine consent, reframe it. And on this view, the problem isn't that consent is seen as the central guiding norm, it's that it's wrongly defined or too narrowly defined. This is the view that I adopt in my paper, A Phenomenological Approach to Sexual Consent, and I want to tell you a little bit about why. So. I think that we can redefine consent away from the connotation of giving permission by going back to the Latin origin, the etymology. I'm a philosopher trained in phenomenology, and one of the main aims of phenomenology is to describe experience as it shows up for us in an embodied, rich way. And uh, one thing that phenomenologists often do in their descriptions of experience is return to words and sort of probe words uh, to see if we can redefine them, right? So using existing words in our descriptions of things rather than coming up with new terms altogether. Although coming up with new terms too can be a great thing. What interests me about the Latin origin of consent is that it actually means to feel with, con, with, sentire, to feel. And so I suggest that by redefining consent as feeling with, we can move away from this overly individualistic and legalistic picture of consent as something that one person, usually a um, woman gives to someone else, usually a man in our patriarchal society, and instead to think about the rich and embodied interaction between people in sexual experiences. I'm not the first to propose redefining consent as feeling with based on the Latin origin. This has been recently proposed by a number of other feminist philosophers, including Linda Martine Alcoff, Manon Garcia, and Kelly Oliver. But I really want in this article to present a robust account of what it actually means. Like, what does it mean to redefine consent as feeling with? And I draw on the tradition of phenomenology for a few indications. First, I give an account of embodiment according to phenomenology, which is like a huge task. So it's a brief one, right? Um, this is me describing an argument that I make in a longer paper, which itself is heavily footnoted and drawing on the work of a lot of scholars. So I'm aware of the limitations here, just presenting an overview. Please check out the paper if you're interested in more. But in phenomenology, there is a resolute anti-dualism. There's a sense that we get things wrong anytime we begin with a separation between mind and body because consciousness is thoroughly embodied. There is no mind that is separate from the body. And one of the problems with standard consent discourse, to my mind, is that it treats consent as something that happens in the mind, um, such that the mind decides what another person can do with your body. And so it's already starting from this weird dualistic uh, Point. And so instead, I show that in phenomenology, the body is viewed as the locus of inactive consciousness. It is a unified whole that is expressive of intentions um, without us needing to presume that the body expresses intentions of the mind, right? Like there's a there's a unification that's happening there. And phenomenology also makes a distinction between two kinds of intentionality operative intentionality, which is the primary form of directedness towards the world. Operative intentionality involves our habits, things that usually don't show up for conscious experience. The fact that when I see a doorknob, my first instinct is to reach out and grab it rather than to cognitively think to myself, oh, there's a doorknob out there. And then there's a second kind of intentionality, which is more reflective, cognitive, and related to uh, our usual conception of agency in the world, and that is act intentionality. 
And act intentionality um, is usually where people stay when they're thinking about sexual ethics. But I'm trying to say that we also need to be thinking about operative intentionality, all of the ways that our bodies are reaching for each other in sexual encounters, rather than um, thinking that there are these minds that are <laughs> sort of meeting through the medium of their bodies. And so one of the insights of phenomenology of embodiment is to move away from thinking of the body as the medium or vehicle for the mind's intentions. Another aspect of phenomenology that I think is really important to foreground in reconceptualizing consent is what's known as the direct perception account. For phenomenology, perception is a social act. It's not as if we passively receive the contents of the external world and then translate them in the mind. Rather, perception is already what's known as smart, meaning that it already has these social valences. It itself is interpreting the behaviors of others rather than, as I said, being a sort of translation mechanism. Perception is a complex phenomenon that is deeply related to memory, emotion, and to motor activity, such that perception itself is interpretive and affective. It involves um, sort of sensations that are evaluative in nature, positive or negative valences. And it also involves layers of pre-reflective intentionality, of which operative intentionality is one kind. What's more, perception is intersubjective according to phenomenology. It's related to what some early phenomenologists call empathy or feeling into another's experience. Now, I think the direct perception of others is a really important notion to keep in mind. Um, I buy it as a phenomenologist, but I want to address one potential objection which is known in sexual ethics as the miscommunication theory. According to the miscommunication theory, the reason that we need really explicit consent that is verbally expressed is because otherwise people are liable to accidentally sexually violate people because there was miscommunication involved. And I just want to say on that point that first off, the direct perception theory doesn't suggest that we always are perceiving others emotions and behaviors correctly or desires correctly. Rather, it's just saying that the miscommunication, if there is any, is actually happening often on the very level of perception. Like you are misperceiving when you uh, misunderstand somebody else's advances rather than the understanding happening on this higher or different level from the perception itself. And another thing is that empirically speaking, there's some really interesting literature to suggest that actually Sexual violation is not often the result of a genuine misunderstanding where somebody thinks like, oh, I really thought she wanted it because she didn't say no. In fact, there's a sense, and this is coming from a study that I cite in the paper, often men actually use this idea of miscommunication as a bad faith shield for sexual assault. And miscommunication is just not as prevalent as we think as a reason for, uh, for sexual violation. So given this emphasis on direct perception and embodiment coming out of phenomenology that I've just been talking about, what does it actually mean to say that consent is feeling with rather than a form of giving permission? As I mentioned before, consentiri in Latin means to feel with. Um, and specifically, we can think about it as an agreement of feelings. It's actually quite similar to the English sympathy. And so to feel with or this agreement of feelings is not only an agreement to do something. I think the way that we tend to think about consent today is as an agreement to do something. But in fact, we can think about it as this agreement of feelings. And that helps to reframe things. And for me, this doesn't mean that we need to feel the same things as another person. A really important motivating force for me in this paper is the desire to give an account of sexual ethics that's going to be attuned to the rich and complex embodied character of sexual experiences without lapsing back into a conservative morality that suggests that you have to know somebody super, super well and have the same feelings as they have in order to have ethical sex, right? And the reason that I say that's conservative is because that uh, often is associated with this idea that permissible sex can only happen in loving relationships, perhaps even in marriages, perhaps even in monogamous and heterosexual marriages. I don't want to say that at all. I want to have a really 
broad sexual ethic that's also going to factor in um, how many encounters between strangers or one night stands can also be perfectly permissible. So I don't think that we need to feel the exact same feelings of another or even necessarily to know cognitively exactly what their feelings are, but rather that we recognize both self and other as embodied subjects of experience. And specifically that we recognize each other as embodied subjects of desire, desire for one another and desire for continuing the experience. One thing that comes up in some of the literature on enthusiastic consent is that it needs to be ongoing. And I think that is absolutely right, but I don't necessarily think it needs to be ongoing in the sense of explicitly asking verbally at each moment. Um, like, is it okay if I do this? Is it okay if I do that? It's a really funny SNL skit from the 90s that makes fun of the Antioch College consent policy on this uh, point. And of course, this isn't to say that verbally checking in throughout an encounter isn't a good thing. It very well can be a good thing. I just want to say that it doesn't necessarily have to be present in order for there to be an ethical sexual encounter. Um, but there is, I think, in sexual experiences that are genuinely consensual, a uh, felt desire between the parties that are engaging to continue and to deepen the encounter. I end up defining consent in the paper as, and I got, gotta read this here because it's an academic paper, an intercorporeal and dynamic coexistence of desiring bodies where desire has a triadic structure. One erotically desires the other, erotically desires that the other desire oneself, and desires an unfolding of erotic experience with the other. Basically, to feel with is to desire with. And I want to say a little bit about what I'm calling the triadic structure of desire here. So I think that in sexual experiences, uh, the nature of desire has three components to it. The first is that you erotically desire the other, right? You're desiring them and you're desiring them in a specifically erotic way. The second is that one also desires that the other desire oneself. And so there's this sense in which I am not only sort of desiring the other person, but I am also desiring that they desire me. And uh, I think that this is a really important thing that sometimes sexual ethics overlooks is the way that the eroticized self shows up. And I'm inspired in this account, partly by the work of contemporary philosopher Talia Mae Betcher, who has one of my favorite contemporary philosophy essays, When Selves Have Sex, and then also by uh, existential phenomenology. Both Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir have versions of, of this view of what Betcher would call the eroticized self as part of their notion of sexual desire. And then the third element of the triadic structure of desire is that one desires an unfolding of erotic experience with the other, right? And that goes back to that temporality that I mentioned a moment ago, this uh, future orientedness towards deepening of the encounter. Some queer theorists would potentially have issue, I think, with the notion that sexual desire is oriented toward the future, because there's also this conservative a sexual ethic that suggests that the aim of sexual desire is orgasm or release, especially resulting in a child. And so queer theorists often will come along and say, well, no, the sexual encounter is not leading towards some goal. The point is, say, the pleasure in the moment. And I get that. <laughs> um, I buy that. I don't think that a sexual experience needs to result in uh, orgasm or let alone a child in order to be uh, ethically permissible. But I do think that there is this temporal dimension where desire really does involve a continuation and deepening of the experience, even if there's not a specific goal in mind. One of the signals that the desire is over is that there is no longer a desire for that continuation or deepening. So I am thinking about going back to the stuff about perception that I discussed earlier. I'm thinking about consent as a tuned erotic perception. And so this is really the upshot of moving away from a notion of consent as giving permission, right? It's rather that it is actually a specific kind of perception, a tuned erotic perception. And erotic perception I'm defining as a particular mode of direct perception that is directed towards a desired other body, an erotically desired other body. Um, and it's not primarily cognitive. A tuned erotic perception is affective, it is temporally stretched, as, as we were just talking about, and directly sensed and felt. 
it can also be more or less attuned. And so I think that we need to be habituated to developing consent by reshaping our operative intentionality, those habits that were discussed earlier, because it's on that level of habits that often some of the really nefarious social scripts from our culture show up. And I think this is essential for those of us who are socialized under patriarchy. Contemporary philosopher Caleb Ward has a really interesting account of how those who are privileged under patriarchy, especially white cisgender men, really have to develop tools to unlearn their own privilege such that genuine sexual consent becomes possible or sexual agency in Ward's term. And we can't ignore that there are stark power imbalances that we have all been socialized to enact from a very young age. Check out the article if you are interested. I recognize that this is far from the last or only word on the topic, and I look forward to speaking with future scholars and developing better norms for sexual ethics with them in the future.